It's your turn now, and I want you to turn to hymn number 270, Joy to the World. Would you please stand as we sing, Joy to the World. 270.
I got so anxious to get into that other number, I just skipped the quartet. And by the way, the reason the duet didn't sing today, both of us have a throat problem. So next week, we're hoping to sing that song. But if we don't sing that one, we'll sing something else. Or stay home. Come on, ring those bells. We're on track now. Everybody likes to take a holiday. Everybody likes to take a rest. Spending time together with the family. Sharing lots of love and happiness. Come on, ring those bells like the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Celebrations come because of something good. Celebrations we love to recall. Mary had a baby boy in Bethlehem. The greatest celebration of them all. Come on, ring those bells. Come on, ring those bells. Like the Christmas tree. Jesus is the king. The king born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King, born for you and me. Come on, ring those bells, everybody say. Jesus, we remember this your birthday. Jesus, we remember this your
Christmas day. Oh, can you hear the angels singing Alleluia? All of heaven is celebrating this day. Oh, gather round and listen to our story. How Mary's boy child came that blessed Christmas day. another one in the same sort of rhythm, a little smoother, but it's Can You See the Light, and it's really an invitation to come and meet Jesus Christ and call him your Lord.
did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save your sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. How many here had John 3.16 as one of the verses that you first memorized in Sunday school? Let me see your hand. I think that there were two people who missed that Sunday. And I think the point being that at least for me as a pastor, sometimes I skip over these verses that I know are basic to you and me. To try to get on to some of the other passages in God's word so that we can have a people who are fully introduced to the word of God. But there are times when we need to go back to the basics and we need to go back to the essentials. 
Question number two. If you had your choice and you knew that you could know fully the mind of God, but it would be in only one or the other category, not both, would you rather know everything there is to know about how God created his universe or how much he loves you and what his plans are for you? Those would be the two choices. But notice, in the end, we get both. But it seems to me that right now we would not be here if we did not have some type of a commitment to that second area. And John 3.16 flows so smoothly that even in our childhood we can understand the message. But if we step back and take a look at it, when you look at the thus and the so of the verses, you're looking at the mind of God as he saw fit to reveal it to you and me. And so we should feel privileged that God would share his private thoughts with us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. One of the first things that we see is the intensity of God's love. For that verse to love, in the tense that John used, speaks of something that is permanent, speaks of something that is changeless, speaks of something that is timeless, speaks of something that is unconditional. And there have been days in my life when I can do nothing but thank God that his love for me is unconditional. For if it were conditional, I would be out in the cold. And we rejoice in that, of his unconditional love for you and for me. And that is the intensity of it. There needs to be intensity of love to stay the course. Over my years as a pastor, and finding myself in the office counseling one another. I don't know how many times I have heard a spouse say, I guess I don't love you anymore. I still love you, but I can't put up with this. So I guess I don't love you anymore. Where would we be if God were to say, I don't love you? anymore. I have selected the term intensity when commitment would be just as appropriate. But I want us to see the intensity of the commitment for he stays the course of love. You and I may falter, but his love for us makes up the difference. Notice the thus so Thus God so loved. It has been, it is, and it always will be. But to what extent? God so loved that he gave. Now we know. Now we know the extent. And the extent speaks of sacrifice. How many of us would stand prepared to sacrifice our children, for someone who doesn't care. Because when we started off in our walk, before we entered into the walk of faith, we did not care. That is the mark of unbelief. We may appreciate the gesture, but it means little or nothing to us. Along the way, I've had people say, I appreciate God's love. I appreciate what Jesus has done, but I don't need it. We thank God that the nature of his love extends to those who do not care, and he still extends his love to those who do not care 
But some of us have heard and we have understood by the prompting of his grace to understand and to see the value. And that then raises the question, what is the value? I'll not ask you to raise your hand to have a show of how many here are going to do regifting. Now, I didn't realize what regifting was till a few years ago. And you know what it is, don't you? In case you don't, that means you got a gift and you thanked the person for it and you said, oh, what am I going to do with this? Oh, I know, I'll pass it on. <laughs> it's economics 101. But God gave something to us of value. And we do not regift this. We either spurn it or we receive it. But let us be reminded of what we have received. And perhaps let us be reminded of what we have been spurning. For that term, only begotten, means one of a kind. I forget the name of the jewel that was in the paper a few weeks ago. Maybe you do. I think it was some kind of a perfect diamond or a near perfect diamond. And I heard it sold for so many million dollars. I was so sorry because I had just about that same amount in my billfold. <laughs> but its perfection makes it one of a kind. And the fact that in other ways with some of the attributes and characteristics about this gem. There's none other like it. And what would you think if you were walking down the street and somebody said, here, would you like this rock? Oh, by the way, it's such and such a diamond. These are how many carats there are. And this is the color. I think that plays into it too. I'm not sure. But we'll say it does. This is the color of it. And it is perfect. It's so many carrots, and you would say, no, thank you, I don't like vegetables. <laughs> There's something wrong with that picture. And this is what the term only begotten means, one of a kind, unique, nothing else like it in all of existence. And when we travel back on the logic we see the extent that God's love would go, that he would give to you and to me the only begotten, the unique, one of a kind, of infinite value, more than just a great treasure, an infinite treasure. And that's the reason we sing. That's the reason we gather together to be thankful and to remind one another of what it is that we have received by love. And notice the access of God's love. That whoever believes. Notice the term whoever. There's no discrimination there. There's no discrimination on race. There is no discrimination on nationality. There's no discrimination on gender. There's no discrimination on anything. It's just whoever. Whoever needs to know of God's love and whoever believes. And the term belief means to establish a relationship of confidence. I have heard God's statement of love. I have seen God's statement of love. Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. I have read and heard the testimonials about this great gift. I understand it clearly. I believe it to be true. And I have taken action. 
I have entrusted my life into his care and keeping, and I have done so with the utmost confidence that what he says he will do, because what he says about himself is true. And belief is not an act. It is an attitude that allows us to enter into a perpetual relationship with the only one of a kind. And we do so not because we first loved him, but because he first loved us. For had God not taken the step, how else would we know? For one thing is certain, if we were to go back to that original question and we would select A and know all about the universe, its beginnings, its purposes, and all that, it would not display Jesus Christ as God's gift of love, as does the advent and the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And notice the effects that whoever places his or her confidence in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Some time back now, I ran into a friend that I hadn't seen for years, and I love the lies we tell. He says, Furrow, you look the same as you did 20 years ago. And I'm thinking to myself, when I looked in the mirror this morning, I don't think I have as much hair now as I did then. What's he talking about? And you know what? I told the same lie. I said, you do too. What we really mean by that is, even though we've changed so much, we can still recognize one another. <laughs> That's what that means. And we understand that time takes its toll. But we also have come to understand that time can only take its toll for a while because this one, who is the one of a kind, is also the bread of life, the resurrection, and the life. And therefore, what nature seems to do so equitably, only the great gift can undo and have eternal life. And John had two basic choices for life. One that would place the emphasis upon the biological and the other that would place the emphasis upon the internal, the mind, the soul. And that's where real living begins and that's where real living is sustained. And when we have come to place our confidence in Jesus Christ, we have already begun to live the eternal life. And we leave the remainder to him who told his people, I am the resurrection and the life. This is why we rejoice in Advent. This is why we rejoice in the incarnation, the word becoming flesh and tabernacling among us. This is why we make a big to-do about history because God in the flesh has entered human existence and has delivered us from an empty eternal existence. That's what perishing is. John also wrote, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Notice the shift in the language from John 3 to 1 John 3. In John 3.16, it's whoever believes. In 1 John 3, it is the love that the Father has bestowed upon us. We who have already placed our confidence in him. Notice the ongoing effect that we would be called the children of God. I grew up in a church where everybody was a brother or a sister, except for us little kids. 
and especially accept us as high school kids. We were something else, and the eyebrow would be raised as to whether or not we were a brother or a sister, but time would tell. And sometimes that word, those words, brother or sister, are thrown about with about the same amount of consideration as sir or ma'am. It's a polite word to say. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we who are gathered here in the name of Christ and we have placed our confidence in God through Jesus Christ, we are a part of that family. And family is important to most of us. But family changes, doesn't it? Some of the people who were the most important in my life I hold out the hope that I'll see them someday in the presence of Christ. But now you can only find their names on the family tree when you Google the right place. But this is a family. And the only way that it will really change is when more will be added to it. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Don't you love that sound? I am a part of the everlasting family. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So much of the philosophy that underpins the cultural nature and state of our time has changed significantly. Now we go off to college and we are taught that we might be, that we are a biological organism, but beyond that we have no identity and we must spend our lives creating our own identity. And if we don't like who we are today, let's change it. There's so uns much uncertainty there. There's no real guarantee of completion, and if the completion, what does it matter? This is why we rejoice in the fact that it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know what we're going to be. We know that because of Jesus Christ, we are the children of God, and we know that when he, our elder brother, appears, we will be like him. I already know my identity. I know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know what I'm about, and I know where I'm going. And somebody can laugh and call it some kind of a figment of the imagination, and I will say, fine, I like mine better than yours. <coughs> mine does so much for me. And besides that, I take it to be true. And I'll tell you why. It has not yet appeared as to what we will be, but this we know, that when he does appear, we're going to be changed, and we're going to be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. He does not come back totally the same as before the resurrection. And it's going to take a tremendous transformation to see him as he is, but the guarantee is in place that a transformation is going to take place and then I will see him as he is. And won't that be great? On some Monday mornings, I say, mm, Lord, the transformation, if it comes in the next few minutes, that's fine by me. And Alice all the time says, I can hardly wait to see you transformed, Don. <laughs> she doesn't really say that. I have to say that, otherwise my life is short. <laughs> but you see the hope that we have and the joy that that hope gives. And if we cannot rejoice at this time of the year, 
that we have set aside for that period that we call Advent, there's no reason to rejoice at all. Because in the end, we are to live the life that has been given to us by way of the Advent. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever places his or her confidence in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Simple to understand, simple to do. In so many words, he still stands there and says, here's the gift. Please take it. Why should I take it? Because I love you? If that's not enough, nothing is. God bless you, and Merry Christmas. Stand as we sing, O come all ye faithful, and it's him. 249, O come all ye faithful. One of the great Christmas carols of all time. closing prayer, I would like to have you just give a word of thanks to the choir. They had to endure a tribulation all their own under the taskmaster, Alice Ann Furl. But they hung in there, and they did well, and we appreciate the added time and effort. So let's thank them, please. Love you, taskmaster. <laughs> And we set up our order of worship a little bit differently so you didn't get to shake hands. So right after we have the prayer, I want you to do two things. I want you to shake hands. Everybody around you is a visitor except you. So you have to make everybody feel comfortable and at home. And you welcome them here and invite them back for a little bit of fellowship afterwards. And then come and be with us this evening at 6 o'clock. 
When I grew up, our pastor always gave the announcements a second time during the prayer. I don't do that. I do that before the prayer. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we could gather together to enjoy each other's company, to fellowship in the faith that is ours in Christ Jesus, to rejoice in the greatness of your love. And we ask our Father that we will be encouraged as we give some thought once again to the greatness of who you are and the greatness of your love for us. As we go our way, guide, direct, and use us to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Shake hands. That gives me time to get to the door. Thank you.